Okay, I think we can get started. Congrats to everyone for being here after the banquet last night. Um, our first speaker of the morning is James Gray, who's going to continue with the Calabiao metric topic. Uh, we'll have the usual schedule, two lectures, coffee break, then another lecture. The only difference this morning is that the third lecture of the morning is going to be online. Um, so yes, yeah, Andre will tell us about the logistics of that um, in a few minutes, but um, right now let's turn it over to James. Thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, so as always, do ask questions anytime, Reg, stop. So the first thing I wanted to do before I forget is to advertise the tutorial, the second tutorial, I think, today uh, by Ed Hurst. So that's sort of going to be the tutorial that roughly speaking goes with what I've been talking about here and looks to me like Ed's done a really nice job on that. So the first thing to say about that tutorial is I think now up on the web page, there's some instructions for that. Um, getting nods. Um, so you just need to download Sage. It, it's, it's super quick and easy. Um, and then what Ed has done is he's set up a Sage notebook, so a Jupyter a notebook that's going to take you through a particular calculation. What he's done is he's set up like a toy model of the kind of thing we're talking about here. So I'm not going to get into too many details because that's what he's going to do, right? But instead of working on a Kalar Bial, it's on P1. Instead of solving the differential equations for Rishi flatness, it's some simpler differential equation. And, you know, he's still got all the, the stuff that you need to learn, like point sampling that we're going to do today, the ANSATs, tuning the parameters in the ANSATs to get the thing you want. But it's like a toy model of everything. And he's, he's set it up so there's something for everybody there. So if you're a complete beginner at this stuff, he's going to take you through the cells of the notebook one by one. So you, can, you have a working example that you can then work from yourselves. And so you can see how everything works. And if you're used to this stuff, you've done it a lot before, I believe he's got a bunch of stretch goals of things you can try. Things like, for example, playing around with the, the functionals, playing around with point something. He's got a, a bunch of stuff. So it sounded really fun. It's also going to lead in nicely, I believe, to the last tutorial in this course where the complexity is going to get upped, right? So that's Yidi Kui and Ki, if I'm saying his name wrong, sorry, Yidi. Um, and what he's going to do is he's first of all going to, you know, make the thing that you're solving the proper equations, but he's not going to, he's going to do it in the flat space. And then finally, you're going to start building some actual Calabria metrics. And that's going to be done, I believe, using the package that Magdalena wrote. So it's sort of, these two tutorials will build you up from, from sort of base level mm -hmm. up to, hey, look, I know what's going on in these packages. I can use them. And it's not just a black box is the hope. So check it out. Sounded like it was going to be fun. Um, so last time, or Calabria manifolds, um, just need to do a couple of beef reminders of equations I'm going to use right now. So remember, the basic idea is our, our overarching plan is we're making an ansatz for the Kähler potential, K, which has some parameters in it, H. I was speaking to Magdalena after my uh, talk yesterday, and she pointed out that using uh, K for the degree of a polynomial in a lecture where you have K for the Kähler potential is perhaps suboptimal. And seeing as D wasn't used, maybe that would have been a better choice. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm totally committed now. Like, if I try and change that, we're all doomed, right? So, I'm, so if, if it's not clear which K I'm talking about, just ask me. It's not obvious. But possible point of confusion. But as I say this, I see like 50 nods in the room. So yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So um, yeah, this K is the Kähler potential. So we have an ansatz for the Kähler potential. It's got some parameters in it. And what we're going to do is we're just going to tune the parameters, tune the H's to get as close as we can to uh, the Rishi flat metric. So if you take two derivatives, of the Kähler potential, you get a metric. We just want to tune the parameters. So if you take two derivatives of that Kähler potential, you get as close as you possibly can to Rishi flat. We're going to see how we do. So that's the plan. And we just need some of the definitions I use just because I'm just going to immediately start using them in detail again. So let me just write them up again quickly. It won't take long. So my homogeneous coordinates are Z on Pn. My index, lower race, my affine coordinates on a patch C. So the patch C is the patch where ZC is not equal to zero. And that allows me to divide by ZC so I can have affine coordinates ZA over ZC. Um, 
I sort of work for a general PN most of the time, but honestly, what we're really doing is the quintic. So a degree five polynomial, the solutions to a degree five polynomial in P4, a particular type of club, yeah? But it would work for any N, for any dimension of projective space. Um, and then we had some notations for polynomials. So there was two sets of polynomials. So first of all, we had the degree K, sorry, polynomials in the Zs. Um, and this was all degree K polynomials. And that's massive overkill in a bad way. And the reason is, is you can have, if this is your, your PN, and this is your club Yao, you can have lots of different polynomials on PN that restrict to the same function on, on the club Yao, on that line. Right? And so we want to remove that redundancy. So what that redundancy looks like is two polynomials would be equivalent on restriction to the club Yao if they're related by a term that's proportional to the defining polynomial, the defining quintic equation of the club, yeah, this, this, this fine gentleman, um, because that's the thing you set to zero on the club, yeah. So if you evaluate both sides of this on the club, yeah, it will be the same because that goes to zero. This is some polynomial factor, any polynomial that makes up the degree. And so we remove that redundancy to get a smaller set of polynomials. We just choose one element of each equivalence class in whichever way you like, and I call those little pk. And perhaps the more useful way, given my handwriting, to identify those is they're labeled with a script capital A. And just to, to give a name to the number of them, I say there's NPK of them. Um, thumbs up. Sorry, say. Yeah, that's right. So this is a, a basis of polynomials on the club. Yeah, in some sense. Yeah. In, in fact, in this case, it is. Exactly. And so why do you want a basis of polynomials on the club? Yeah, well, that's how we write down our ANSAT. So we have what's called the algebraic Kähler potential. Algebraic K. And this, this expression is gonna have two Ks in it and they're different. Anyway, um, so on a patch C, remember that's the patch where ZC is not equal to zero. The algebraic Kähler potential is one over the degree. Actually, the overall factor doesn't matter, but it's one over the degree log of h a b bar and then these little p's these p's where you've removed the redundancy the function of the affine coordinates but this is the degree this is the kala potential on this patch so the idea here is i've just written an ansatz that's basically some kind of expansion in this basis of polynomials that are different on the club yow as, as andre says and then I have some, some coefficients. This is a Hermitian matrix, so the whole thing's real. Because then when you take two derivatives, you get a real metric, right? But this is just some matrix of parameters. And the idea is you can choose those within reason to be anything you like, right? If you choose them all to be zero, that's probably a bad choice, right? So there are some bad choices, but they can vary. They can be different things. And so we just want to vary these until the metric that you get from this Is that we want to vary these parameters h until that matrix is close as we can get it to Rishi flat. Thank you. There isn't one. Um, the reason it was there is I had some motivation about relating this to the Fubini study when we first derived it. But if I change this overall factor, I will change an overall factor here. That will change an overall factor in the metric. So you're just scaling the manifold. And for a Rishi flat metric, you can just change the scale and, and nothing changes. That's because the Rishi tensor doesn't depend on scale. It's got the same powers of metric and one over metric. So the equations we're solving don't depend on scale. So you can put a badger out the front here. It doesn't matter what you put here. One over K is what's there. Some of the literature uses one over K, some of them uses one over pi K. Um, so that's our algebraic Kähler metric. We've seen all kinds of fun things about that, how it's secretly the pullback of the fubini sudi metric on some giant projective space in which we've embedded the manifold. It doesn't matter, right? It's just some ansatz for the Kähler potential that someone told us is gonna work. That's someone being jumped. There is a problem, practically, 
which is that for high k, when the degree gets high, so for high k, little k, there is a lot of parameters. Well, not a lot in the context of this um, workshop, actually, but for conventional methods, there's a lot of parameters in this matrix H. And historically, in terms of implementing these methods, that has been prohibitive. There are too many. It's too many to tune to try and get the Rishi flat metric. Too, it's just too much computationally. And so what people have done is, so people have worked on examples with lots of symmetry. So the classic one that most people do is they take the defining relation, which is this quintic polynomial, can be anything, and they take it to be z0 to the 5 plus z1 to the 5 all the way up to z4 to the 5, or zn to the 5 in general, which is a very special quintic polynomial. And the reason they do that is that has a lot of symmetry. You can just keep the polynomials in this expansion that respect that symmetry if you want. And then the number of parameters go down because you're only keeping very few of these polynomials, ones that respect symmetry. So there's not as many polynomials in this expression here, and so there's not as many parameters. I'll come back to them. Anyway, at the end of the day, we have this Kähler potential, and we want to tuning. We want to tune. We want to tune the parameters. So for the tuning of H, we're going to try two things. One of which we've started to see, just at the end of last time and one of which we'll see somewhat briefly today. So the first thing you can do is you can minimize a function. This is the approach we've started. So you come up with some functional that has a unique minimum when the metric is Rishi flat. You plug your ansatz into that functional and you do minimum, find minimum in whatever your favorite way is, and then you get some parameters and you plug that back into the ansatz and that should be a Rishi flat metric. That's what we're gonna talk about first. And the other thing, the other way that people have tried to, to do this is the Donaldson algorithm. And what you have here, and we'll talk about it in a minute, is there's an, a certain operator that you can iterate. And if you iterate that operator, you'll get a certain type of metric. And as the degree gets high enough, that metric will be the Rishi flat one. We'll see that as we go along. But these are the two methods. We're, we're working currently on the first one. Sorry for the recap, but I do need to do this because I'm going to use it all. So let's, let's go back to the minimization of the functionals. So this is the functional approach. And I'm, there's a couple of key players that we're going to talk about a lot today. First of all, we have a particular measure, a tip, particular top form that we can use to integrate over the Calabi-L. This is a holomorphic form. So for the for Calabi-L threefold, this is a holomorphic three form. This is its conjugate. So this is a top form. Lara told us how this looks in her lectures. The only thing that we care about today, well, there's one other little thing we'll care about, but mostly the only thing we'll care about today is this is known you can write it down for the quintic in closed, short, analytic form. That's all I care about. Why is that? Why is do I care about that? It's gonna allow me to integrate over the Club Yao because I know what an integration measure on the Club Yao is. Another thing we use is this function V. That's J to the N. So for the quintic, this would be J to the three because it's a three complex dimensional manifold over N factorial mu. So J, it is a two form, and if I look at its um, its components, they're given by the derivative of the Kähler potential. So it's very, very closely related to the metric. We define this function here. So if this is a two form, and I take a third power of it, that's also a top form. It's also something with six indices. So just like this is a top form, so is j to the n. Any two top forms on a manifold are proportional. And if two forms are proportional, you can talk about their ratio. You know, I can't talk about the, the ratio of a two form with a one form because it doesn't, well, I mean, normally it doesn't mean anything, right? But here I could talk about a ratio of two top forms because they're always proportional. And this is just a function. And just to emphasize, this is a function that you can practically build out of your ansatz. 
Remember, we have that ansatz for k. If I plug it in here, I get the two form j. If I plug that in here, and I know mu, which I do, I can get this function explicitly as a function of those parameters. It's not particularly nice, but you can get it. Not particularly bad either, it's just some derivative of logs cubed, right? V has some nice properties that we're gonna use a lot. First of all, V equals constant is the Mont-Jampère equation. So if you're, how do you spell ampere? With an ampere. If you set this equal to constant, right, you're setting J to the N equal to omega wedge omega bar. And that's called the Mont-Jampère equation. And that was the thing that Yao proved. If you can solve that, it's equivalent to having a Rishi flat metric on the club, Yao. So that's a nice property of this V function. Another one is you can write the Rishi curvature in a really cute little way with it. It's just minus the double derivative, even with normal derivatives of log of V. Okay, that's all the definition. So we have, all this setup, we have these nice coordinates, we have these polynomials, that gives us an ansatz. Once we have an ansatz for k, we can plug it in here, get these functions with these properties, and we have lots of stuff. So what are the two functionals? We're gonna look at the two functionals that are most often used. One thing I wanted to emphasize is I'm gonna talk about functionals that you can write, that you plug your ansatz into, and if you minimize them, you'll get this Rishi flat metric. You can just go ahead and make up your own. There's no statement that these are the only functionals that do the job. There is no statement that these are the best functionals that do the job. You may be interested in something, a Kähler manifold, that is not a Calabi L. We'll just make up a different functional one. So a lot of this stuff is modular, but you can adjust. Okay. So the first functional is called the Mont-Jampère functional. And it's often called, given the name H just because it's like an energy function, right? You're minimizing an energy. And then um, that's given by this integral. We're obviously integral over the club. Yeah, we're obviously um, the average of a function is just the integral of that function over the club. Yeah, divided by the volume. So this is the one we saw last time. And just to emphasize how explicit this all is, right? So we have to talk about how you integrate over a club, yeah. But ignoring that, mu is some known object. It's just an expression for it. V is this, this function that I just talked about that you can build out of the ansatz. And this is built out of V as well. This is something you can write there. And it has lots of nice properties. This is my favorite one. Um, so for example, it's positive semi-definite. It's a square, right? It has a global minimum when um, V equals a constant, the average of V, and that's the Mont-Jampère equation. So it has, a global, it has a global minimum when the metric is club Yau. No other critical points. And the really nice thing about it is there's no derivatives of J involved. There's no derivatives of J or the metric involved in computing this. If you look at V there, it's just powers of J. So yes, you have to take your Kähler potential, take two derivatives there. But after that, there's no more derivatives involved. And just practically, that's nice. That's in contrast to what we'll see for the Rishi loss. So if you knew how to integrate over a club, yeah? Uh, this is all very explicit. You could plug your ansatz in, get V, plug in mu, which is known, plug that all in here integrate, it would give you a function of the parameters h, and you could go to Mathematica and do fine minimum. Yeah. Yes, you change the functional. So here, you, so if you, if you wanted something different, you wouldn't ask for the Mont-Jampère equation. So for example, say you wanted a manifold with positive Rishi scalar. Right, you just do Rishi scalar minus seven mod squared. Now it'll give you a manifold with positive Rishi scalar, right? 
So if you muck around with, as long as we've made an ansatz here that's Kayla. So, so far, and I'm going to talk about this again later, it has to be Kayla, but, you know, you can just play around with the function using similar techniques, the functional using similar techniques, and you can either try and find better ways to get club yeah, or you can try and get other things. Okay, that's the Mange and one. Yeah, so this is stuff I already did, so apologies, but I want to compare them because the other one, which we didn't do, is the Rishi function. This is the other one that's commonly been used. This one is defined as just the Einstein-Hilbert action, basically. Here we are. And if you plug in our, oh, our expression for the Rishi curvature, which is just up there, um, this is just gonna be the integral over X of mu gi j bar, di dj bar log V. So the minus sign went because um, there's a minus sign in the expression for the Rishi, but also um, the factor of two goes just because, you, you know, if you're going to get the Rishi scalar, you can track the Rishi tensor with the metric, but that could be I J bar or I bar J when you do these things in complex coordinates as a factor of two. For some unknown when you compute it, you get this. And again, this is eminently computable. I can get V by plugging my ansatz into an equation that's in the glare for me up there. I can plug V in here, mu is known. This is not so nice, right? I can take two derivatives of K to get G and then I can take its inverse. Okay, good. And so this is something you can write down. In this form, its properties aren't so clear, so you can rewrite this somewhat. Um, so you can rewrite, You make its properties clearer. And this kind of calculation will be very familiar to anyone who's done a GR course, just with a few extra bells and whistles because of the properties of Kähler manifolds. So for example, if you wanted to rewrite this, you can plug in mu. So if I plug in mu, I'm gonna get uh, j to the n over n factorial v, and then the same thing. I dj bar of v. Um, if you actually evaluate this and turn it into a normal sort of integral, this ends up as root g, as you would expect, n factorial v, g i j bar, g i dj bar of v, 6x if I'm plug in. Um, if you actually do this computation, you work out j to the n, that's not what it will look like, just a heads up. And this is for people who are not used to complex manifolds. What you would get here if you actually did the computation just naively is det j i but g i j bar, not square root. Right? What's going on is if you write the entire metric, right? Um, Lara told us that the i j components are zero. So if we wrote it in block diagonal form, you have some zeros up here, and the i bar j bar components of the metric are zero. So you've got some zeros down here, and then you've got these two blocks, which is sort of j i j bar, and it's conjugate j i bar j or something. Right, and so the actual metric is milled out of two pieces of these. So when you take the determinant of the actual metric, it's the square of this, right, just because of this structure. So it just ends up as root G, hardly a surprise. Um, and then you just integrate by parts. It's just like forming a scalar field equation or something, right? So if you integrate by parts, I'm being a bit dodgy with how I do things, right? But, um, integrate by parts, then what you get is um, minus the integral of x i root g, g i j bar over n factorial one over v, g j bar log v. And the reason I'm doing this, normally I just leave this as um, exercise to the reader, but I'm just doing this because um, uh, there's a, a property of actual Kähler manifolds that come in here, which is that you have to use. So this is a little bit different to the usual how you derive the scalar field equation because there's no derivative in here. So when you look at this, if you looked at, so I'm gonna get this derivative hitting this junk and one over V. But if you take a derivative like this, this will be minus root G, gamma J bar I K bar, G I K bar. 
So it's not naively zero, and it wouldn't normally be zero. Um, but there's a property of Kähler manifolds that just tells you that vanishes. So if you're not used to Kähler manifolds and you're doing this, you do the calculation and you'd have a term left over and you'd be annoyed. And it takes a while to realize what's going on. So when you calculate this derivative, this is sort of a general expression that you get, but in, in the cases we're looking at, that's actually zero. So this derivative doesn't hit all this junk and it certainly doesn't hit the number n factorial, right? So it just hits the one over v. So what you actually get is minus the integral of x root g a i j bar for n factorial d i just the one over v d j bar log v and then finally you can just plug mu back in and you know, turn this back into mu using the same formulas and do some jiggery pokery with factors of v and what you finally get the thing we we'll actually need is this function was the same thing as the integral over x of mu g a j bar d i log v d j bar log v the thing wasn't Kayla, that wouldn't be true, but in this case it is. So this is the same as the functional that we wrote at the top, but it's just a more useful form for spotting properties. For example, that's obviously positive semi-definite, right? Basically square or something. So you can spot some properties from this. And you know, if you're doing some of the, the algebra that you have to do in actually setting this up, this is often easier to do. Another point is that if you're calculating derivatives. That derivative is the conjugate of that derivative, whereas the other way at the top, I'd have had to take two derivatives, d i, d i, j. It's a handy thing. So from here, we can see the properties of this functional. Um, it's positive semi-definite again. Everybody should be thinking long, uh, loss function. It's global minimum um, is when v equals constant. which is again the Ricci flat case. So it's got the global minimum we want, obvious from either the top expression for the functional or the one we rearranged it to. Here it's clear that the minimum is when that derivative is zero. Up the top, it's the Einstein-Hilbert action, which you know, from Loyola Lagrange you know has a minimum when the Ricci tensor of vanishes. Has no other critical points. You can do that by direct computation. But critical points. But the problem with it is, is it's just a bit uglier than the monogram pair loss, right? That doesn't mean it's not going to work better numerically, it doesn't. But it doesn't mean it's not going to work better numerically, right? It's just a bit, you know, I have to have an inverse metric. I mean, it's just, yeah. But there's nothing wrong with it. Um, people do use it. And we're going to talk about it. So now we have two functionals, and there's only one piece we're missing. So we have an ansatz, we have a functional to plug it into, and these days we have an absolute plever of already prepackaged methods for finding minimum of stuff. Right? So we could vary the parameters and find a minimum using some prepackaged badger that someone gives us. The only thing we need to know how to do is integrate over a Calabiao. It's the only thing really left, right? And that's gonna be true even for the Donaldson method. Whatever you do, you're gonna to need to integrate over a Calabiao. And so that's the next thing we're going to talk about, uh, integration and point sum. Any questions on the functionals? Yes? You dropped some boundary terms. Yeah, I'm being a bit rough, but yes, I did. It's compact manifold. So. <laughs> that's really glib, what I just said to you, um, but it does work out. Yeah. Good question, by the way. Back of details. Is there anyone, any other? Awesome, that's a really good question. The um, reason it's a, I, my answer to you is a bit glib, right, is how do you actually set up this integral, right? Just partitions of unity and da, 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 da. being a bit shoving it under the carpet. But, but roughly speaking, it works because it's a compact manifold. Okay, integration over the club, yeah, the last piece we need. And basically, this is going to be. Um, Monte Carlo integration. And I could just say, go and read numerical recipes and see what most of us learned that kind of thing from. Um, and so a lot of this is going to be fairly easily readable stuff. But the reason it's worth going through is there are a few subtleties that come with integrating over these complicated compact manifolds. 
to do with point sampling and what kind of distribution of points you get and so forth. And so I really want to go through it because it does play a role. It does play a role. And I think Magdalena will talk about this in the context of these, these packages that she and others have written. So. Um, so let's just start with some basics. Um, this is going to be my usual sort of heuristic, somewhat grubby approach. Um, so we're going to just talk about integration um, first, and we're going to pick just a really simple function where we can spot the answer, use that to motivate writing down the general answer, which people will often recognize. And then after that, we're going to talk about the subtleties. So consider some open set U in some manifold X. Okay. And we're going to define a particular functional distribution which is gonna be, I'm gonna call it this, X, little x here is gonna be a point, I'll try and, which is gonna just be one if our point is in the open set, and it's gonna be zero if the point is not in the open set. Then obviously, the integral over x of this function you with respect to some measure mu, we're gonna be playing around with those measures, but just take some measure mu and do that integral. That's gonna be the volume of the open set with respect to that measure. Right? This function is one if you're in the open set, it's zero otherwise. So it's just picking out the points in the open set. That's just gonna be the volume of that open set. And it's the volume with respect to this measure that you did the integral with respect to. Now, if, and I'm going to underline if, if we have a sample of points, that is on X, that is uniformly distributed. according to the measure mu. Any volume of volume X on the manifold has the same number of points on it, right? It's the, the points are uniformly distributed. So if we're using the measure, the natural measure in this room, we evenly spread the points through this room. If we have a set of points that's uniformly distributed, then for every sample of MP points, let's call them QI, X, the expected number of points, the expected value, the expected number of points in U is just the sum one to the number of points of this function. If the point is in open set, that will give one. If it's out the open set, it will give zero. So this sum is just the number of points in the open set. And the expected value for that is just gonna be the volume according to this measure of your open set divided by the volume according to this measure of the manifold times the number of points. So say the open set is roughly speaking this half of the room, I expect roughly half, and that's half the volume of the total room, I expect half the points here. This is just the ratio of the volumes, how much of the volume is in the open set, multiply that by the number of points, that's the number of points you expect in that open set. If the points are uniformly distributed with respect to this measure we're using, and only if. Here it is. So rearranging this, right? <clears throat> no, no, not this board. There we are. Rearranging this, that volume is this integral here. So plug this in and rearrange. What we're saying is the integral of this function with respect to the measure mu is just the volume with respect to 
mu of the entire thing divided by mp times by this sum. That's a good approximate one. For enough points, that would be a good approximation to the volume. I'm just taking this expression, bringing vol x and mp up on this side, and then I'm just placing volume mu with that. This is a case where you can just spot the answer for the expected integral, and perhaps it's not then too big a jump. I'm going to ask you to make the jump. So you can just put in a different function. Different function. This is just a case where it's really easy to argue. And put in a different function f, then the expected integral, the approximation to the integral, according to Monte Carlo, like these would just be the volume of x with respect to mu, just like we had up here, divided by the number of points. And then sum over the number of points of the value of the function at those points. And this expression is real. I could have just written this down, and it, it's kind of obvious if the points are uniformly distributed. Because what is it saying? This factor here is just saying if I have np points, I'm going to assign volume over np volume to each of those points. I'm going to divide up the volume evenly according to, for each point. How was I allowed to do that? I was allowed to do that because the points were evenly distributed. Each point gets a similar amount of volume. And then I'm going to take that amount of volume that each point has and multiply it by the function at that point, and I'm going to sum up. It's just breaking the space up into even volumes, evaluate the function at that, in that volume, sum them up. Just what you normally think of as um, an integral. Would not gotten through that. Um, would have just asked you to believe this formula if we're not going to um, change things up a bit. But this is the formula for just naive, very naive numerical integration. So what's the problem? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. You have to get your own mic. Um, just out of interest, presumably you can put bounds on the error of this color scheme according to some maybe P1 norm of F. Yeah, you, you can, uh, that's right. There's, there's, so there'll be like, there's an error in this. It's sort of one over root MP and then times something that's got other function, all the usual stuff, finding numerical recipes. I'm actually going to leave errors to later. And we're going to do it all in one go in a really basic fashion. Because what we're going to see then is the numerical errors here are not the problem. So it's, it's, a great, it's a great question, right? I should be much more careful about, okay, how good is this? What do you need? And I'm just going to sweep that to later and do all possible numerical errors in one go in a very, very basic way. Great question. Any other? How which points? I promise he's not a plant. That's exactly what we're going to talk about. Yeah. And so how on earth do you pick a bunch of points on a club? Yeah. And how do you pick them uniformly? And and that's that, that let's just write that out. The problem. How do you pick uniformly distributed points on a Carpi Gal? Basic answer is you don't. And that's going to be a problem, right? I can't use this. I don't know how to pick the uniform points. That's the question. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to modify this setup slightly for cases where our points are not distributed uniformly with respect to some measure that we want. So in particular, there's this measure mu that was omega wedge omega bar that we're actually doing our integration with respect to in those functionals I showed you. And normally, when I show you the point selection schemes, no dice. They're not going to be, the points are not going to be distributed uniformly normally with respect to that measure. So what we need to talk about is how you, how you deal with points given to you in the wrong measure, in a different measure. So for example, if we're integrating over the room and there's like, a bunch more points on this side than this side. It's still not too bad. It's not too sparse over here, but there's more points over on this side than this side. How do you deal with that? That formula does not apply. As is. And what you do 
is you use what's either called weights or mass functions. And the theory here is very simple, but you just need to set it up because otherwise the formula that you get at the end, you're left with the, well, where did that come from? Kind of thing. So what we want to do, say we want to actually evaluate this object, F with respect to some mu, but that mu is not the measure with which our points are distributed. Let's say that our points are distributed with respect to some measure mu prime. Well, I could write this like that. So mu pi prime is going to be the measure the points are distributed with respect to. So that's the thing where we can use our simple integration formula. But mu is the actual measure we want. And we're going to see practically how this comes about in our case in a minute. How do we deal with that? Well, we can use this formula for how you, you integrate up there, right? So um, let me define the mass function, given this, let me define the mass function m to be mu over mu prime. Okay. Well, then this is just some function that I'm integrating with respect to the measure mu prime. So I can use that formula. This will be vol with respect to mu prime of x divided by the number of points. And then instead of just getting the function here, that I actually wanted, I'll get the function and I'll get these mass terms. I'll get this function and I'll get this piece. So that's how you do that. Now this is a little bit irritating because we've got mu prime, the measure we're not interested in appearing in two different places. Um, we have it appearing here in M because it goes into defining M. We have it appearing here in the volume. So you can just, if you want to, you can just get it all in one piece by um, just applying this to the function f equals one. So if we, apply, apply, if we apply this to the function f equals one, this is the volume of x with respect to mu. And that would be this integral, which according to this function with f equals one would just be the volume of mu prime Some of the mass functions. Right? It's the same thing, but with f equals one. And so you can just rearrange this, and you find that the volume with respect to mu prime of x over the number of points. So this thing, just take this underneath, that's just going to be the volume of mu with respect to the thing you actually care about divided by. So some people, for example, um, like Douglas often takes that formula and plugs this in there. And then what you obviously what you get is that um, the integral is the volume divided by the sum of the mass functions. You can argue whether this is useful or not, but it appears a lot in the literature and you may wonder where it comes from. So just for The point is here, um, that you can deal with your points being given to you in the wrong measure, as long as you can compute these mass functions, as long as you know what measure you're being given. So roughly speaking, what's happening in the same sort of intuition we had before, instead of each point being associated a fraction of the volume, so you take the total volume divided by the number of points, that's the amount of volume each point gets when doing the integral, you weight that according to, you know, if you had twice as many points over here as you wanted, you'd give them a factor of a half. So you're only giving it the right amount of volume according to your, to your measure. So you can choose any measure you want. The problem is, how do you sample points? And that's exactly what we're going to talk about. And, and also, you might say, well, just use the other measure. And that's actually going to use mu prime. Don't use mu. And we'll talk about that. I get the impression I missed what you're saying. No, it's OK. Yeah. 
Okay, so who cares? This all looks very basic and unuseful. Um, you care because of point sampling. Fine gentleman in purple t-shirt said, sorry, I don't know your name. Um, you uh, have to sample points on the club. Yeah, that's not obvious. How are we gonna do it? Different methods in literature, just gonna mention two that are used in those papers um, that I mentioned at this, the very start of the le first lecture I gave and which um, uh, these methods are used in things, the stuff that Magdalene is gonna talk about. So the first point sampling is going to be rejection sampling. Sounds very negative. And this is used, for example, in Matt, by Matt Hedrick in his code that you will play with in the last tutorial, I believe. So what Hedrick does is he takes the usual patches on PN, and then you have your Klabiao inside it. He makes slight tweak, because the usual patches on PN are infinite, right? And that's not so good for working with computers. So he takes the affine coordinate to be less than or equal to one um, for all alpha uh, or a not equal to c. So he just takes a disk basically. And then one thing you can do very easily is you can just choose random coordinate values. So you can choose points randomly. Let's call this this patch OC. You can choose points randomly in OC according to the coordinate measure. So, you know, one there, one there, one there, one there, one there. Just shotgun. Then what he does is he says, well, most of those points are nowhere near the club. Yeah, right? This, I don't want this guy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw two lines here and I'm only gonna keep points that lie in that line. Look at how wasteful that is, right? Just keep those points. So in, in more precise terms, you're gonna throw away any point if um, the defining relation evaluated at that point is bigger than some small number. Right. So on the defined club Yau, the defining relation is zero. That's the definition of the club Yau point. So if you just plug your points into the club Yau defining relation, if that's too big, if it's not near enough to zero, you can throw it away really far from the club Yau. Now I'm not gonna go into details, but he has um, a little scheme then to project the remaining points, the ones that are near the club Yau, onto the club Yau. So what he does is essentially, um, so if I blow up a piece of this here, you have a point here, he just projects this perpendicularly down where to measure angles and stuff, you just use the Fabini study. Um, yeah, the Fabini study metric. Find what you mean by perpendicular. So he gets a point, the set of points on the club yeah, like that. So that's one way of getting a set of points on. Oh my goodness, mate. It's one way of getting points on a club yeah. Um, but there are problems with it. It does work. I'm not saying it, it's the most terrible thing in the universe, but there are problems with it. It's wasteful, right? You're throwing away probably most of your points, probably. But more importantly than that, it is hard to know the measure mu prime. Remember mu prime for us is the measure with, which respect, with respect to which the points are distributed. And in this case, it's kind of hard to know what that measure is. I, I don't really know how these points are distributed on the club Yau in a precise way. You can make some rough guesses, but it's a little difficult. Still, it gets the job done. Hedrick gets great results using this. It's not like absolutely deadly. It's just something to bear in mind. So still gets the job done. And as Hedrick points out, in some sense, it doesn't matter. Who cares? Why is he saying that? Well, <clears throat> let's imagine we just distribute the, distribute the points in this way and say, I'm just going to completely ignore the mass functions and just go for the gusto. I, I don't care. I'm just going to ignore the M's and I'm going to pretend these are evenly distributed on the club and I'm just going to compute. No one can stop me, world domination, right? And what you would be computing then, if you ignore mass functions and compute, 
all you're doing is you're computing this functional. Instead of the one we actually wanted, this one. This was some known integration measures. That was nice, right? But this is just some other random integration measure that I'm getting by choosing this distribution point. So who cares? Just calculate that one instead. And to some extent, that's true. And that works right. But you should be careful because there's a potential pitfall here. So let's imagine an extreme situation. This doesn't happen in his application, so which is why he gets away with this. But imagine some extreme examples. There's someone at the back whose name I know. Imagine that over here in the measure mu prime, over here, there's a whole bunch of points, but in that half of the room, there's precisely one point at Fabian at the back there. Imagine using that to compute your Rishi flat metric, right? To, to, to minimize this functional. It's gonna make sure that what you get is nice and Rishi flat over here. It's gonna be super flat, right? And over there, it really doesn't care. You're gonna put a gigantic spike in it or something because it just doesn't get penalized by the function. And so what Hedrick is saying is true. It, in some sense, it doesn't matter as long as this distribution of points is even enough. And for this sampling, it's fine. Why does the same criticism not occur here for mu? Well, remember mu was omega wedge omega bar. And in the minimum of the functional, when the thing is Rishi flat, that is proportional to j wedge j wedge j, the actual volume measure that you're after on the club EL. And so if you minimize the thing and get near enough to minimum, in that sense, that measure will at least give you points distributed according to the actual Calabi-L volume measure. So you might think, might think that that's gonna do better. But at the end of the, oh, at the, end of the day, whoops, you can do it. It's one of the sampling methods that's used in the literature. Let me just show you the other sampling measure quickly and then say a few words and try not eat my like this time. Um, so the second way of sampling points, uh, which is used by many people, um, for example, back in the day, Douglas used this one, is homogeneous sampling in projective space. And here the idea is, is in some senses a little bit more elegant. So you uniformly sample, with respect to the Fabini study metric, I guess, Sample two points, call it measure. Uh, Z1 and Z2 in projective space. Okay, so you're going to uniformly distribute points in projective space. Um, and then what you're going to do is you're going to draw a line between those two, and where the Calabi L strikes that line, those are the points you're going to take on the Calabi L. I'll draw that out in a second. How do you uniformly choose points on projective space? There's a number of ways you can do that. Um, I think Ed actually does this like differently in the tutorial, but for example, one thing you can do is, um, I won't write this up completely, but if you just use the normal distribution, right? To choose homogeneous coordinates. You just randomly choose points weighted like this. This is spherically symmetric. If you're doing this in CM plus one, it will give you spherically Symmetric, it will give you points that are spherically symmetric about the origin. So if you then divide by the norm to get points at radius one, you'll get um, smooth points distributed on a sphere. Um, you could use any spherically symmetric distribution here. It's just a very common one. And then you can divide by a phase and that will give you um, points on them. So you take homogeneous coordinates and you divide by this phase that would give you points uniformly distributed on projective space if you look at the, the definition of projective space. What I'm saying is there's, there's known and easy ways of picking points uniformly distributed on projective space. So you pick two points in that manner. Sorry, I'm running out of time. So if you want more details on that, just catch me at the end. Um, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna just compute the defining equation with those points plugged in with a parameter. 
and then you solve for t to get points on the club, yeah. So the way this is going to look, here's Pn, here's the club Yao, yeah. 0.1, 0 0.2, draw a straight line, straightish line, and it's going to pick you up points on the club Yao. Yeah. For the Quintic, of course, it will be five points. And you can choose, those are your points on the club Yao. Yeah. So why, why is this nice? What are the advantages of this method? But well, it's not as wasteful, right? I'm not throwing anything away. So advantages. It's not as wasteful. I can ask whether that actually matters, but depends on your application. It's not as wasteful, but more importantly, and Douglas has a nice proof of this, that uses some work by other people, the points here are distributed with respect to a known measure. So the resulting points are distributed with respect to the Fibini study measure. Given the symmetry of everything that's gone on there, perhaps not a surprise, but Douglas has a, a nice proof of that using some results by Schiffman and Zel Zel Zeldich in this paper. FTH that paper if you're interested. So finally, we have everything you need. I really run out of time. Um, And define an ansatz, plug it into a functional, integrate that functional over the club Yao, you get some function of the parameters, you find minimum, you get some set of parameters, plug them back into the ansatz, and that will give you a club Yao metric that's approximately Rishi flat. This is the method that most people use these days. There's this other method due to Donson. I'm supposed to finish at the hour, right? Yeah. So I, I don't have time to go through that because I still too slowly, apologies. If you want to see that, just come and find me at some stage, I'll, I'll show you. But the reason that the Donaldson algorithm doesn't get used as much is that in some sense, it's, it's not as good at a fixed uh, degree. So what the Donaldson algorithm does is it's designed to give you something called the balanced metric. So it just gives you some particular metric that's associated to some particular properties. And there is a proof, there is a theorem that says that as the degree of the polynomials goes to infinity, so as the polynomials get very large, that balanced metric becomes the Rishi flat metric on a club yet. That's great. That sounds like it's exactly what you want, right? But there is a catch. Yes, as K goes to infinity, this will become the Rishi flat metric on the club Yao. But no one told you at any finite K that that was the best approximation to Rishi flat. And it's not. And, and people using the Donaldson algorithm back in the day knew that. So the Donaldson algorithm gives you an approximation to the Rishi flat metric that improves as you raise the degree k. For any finite k, the approximation is not as good as, um, as the one you would get from the thing we just did. Skippy, skippy. You can ask how well all this does. Um, I think I'm going to leave that because I'm assuming Magdalena will actually compare methods, and that's perhaps a more meaningful thing to do than me telling you 10 to the minus 9, the value of a functional, what header it gets. Um, but what I will do is I'll just finish by saying, in the last minute, by saying, what are the problems with this conventional method? You know, Fabian, one of the things he was saying in one of his earlier lectures is, first thing you should do is look and see if you've got a nice method it's from somewhere else, right? So what is the problems with this method? So problems with what we've seen. You need symmetry. You need some way of reducing the number of parameters in the ansatz to use a conventional minimum finding technique. You want to get rid of that. It's not a physically sensible situation most of the time. More importantly, all computations have been done in this classical way are at a single point in moduli space. Their parameters moduli, 
four dimensional fields that describe the size and the shape of these Calabi-L manifolds. Some of them are the coefficients in that defining relation. And the Calabi-L changes shape and size as you vary those moduli. And for these methods, as I've shown you, you pick your moduli and then you compute the metric. That sucks. And the reason that sucks is you want the metric as a function of the moduli so you can work out the effective field theory as Lara was talking about, you can do the dimensional reduction as a function of the fields. I don't want the value of my 4D action at one point. I want my 4D action as a function of a field so I can actually use it for something. So this is a big problem, right? And so this is what people have been trying to, one of the things that people have been trying to address with machine learning methods. So for example, um, just to give one case, there's, there's a lot of literature here, but Lara and Fabian and I and Matisse Gerdis, Ben Krippendorf, and Nicole Ragaram. And we had a, a big paper where we did lots of sort of playing around with machine learning approaches to this. And the things we were trying to do, there was a bunch of stuff in there, but some of the stuff we were trying to do was address this kind of stuff. We did not have to restrict the polynomial basis to only include the symmetric ones. We gave metrics as a function of the moduli. And there's even more things that you can do once you, you open up this new arena that you couldn't do in this more classical setting I've been talking about. For example, here we have, I've been, you know, in response to what something Andre said, I said, yes, you can search for different manifolds. But we had an ANSATS, so it had to be Kähler. We had an ANSATS based on a Kähler potential. And you could try and come up with an ANSATS that went directly to a metric, but people haven't done that. One of the things we did in that paper is instead of having the neural net approximate the Kähler potential, we had it approximate the metric. Well, now you're no longer wedded to Kähler, and so, for example, we we're able to do non-Kähler examples. So there are big restrictions associated to these methods. Let me just add the last one I mentioned there. So Kähler only, at least, is stated. And what the types, in addition to just making everything faster, well, the types of things that Magdalena is going to show you is there is qualitatively different and new stuff you can do by moving away from these basic methods, moving away from using fine minimum in Mathematica, which by the way, kudos for getting to this to work with fine minimum in Mathematica to match Hagrid. Moving away from that and using something more sophisticated is actually gonna give you something worthwhile. That's what Magdalena is gonna tell us about. Um, so I'll stop there and ask if there's any more questions. Any questions for James? Yeah. Um, it's a bit weird because naively I would say that when you say that the, the need of symmetry is an, is an issue, mm -hmm. I would say that usually we like to have symmetries in order to understand the, the, the results as a representation of those uh, symmetries. So it's true, right? So symmetries are nice because they give you lots of computational and understanding control. And, and you're 100% right. Um, the trouble is, is that, and you know, there's even some mechanisms in string theory that tend to attract you to symmetric places. The trouble is that that doesn't always happen. So in general, what you would have is, I don't know, it depends on the string theory you're working in. You may have some fluxes and some non-perturbative effects with all sorts of numbers in them, right? And say that you actually manage to stabilize the complex structure in a way you actually believe, with lots of ifs here. Um, I can do that in some context then it's going to give you some value for the complex structure. It's going to give you some value for this polynomial. And in general, it will not be symmetric. Also, even if you're at the symmetric point, the perturbations that would take you away from the symmetric point are moduli of the theory. They're fields in the theory. So in that sense, at least, I'm being a bit glib here, but in that sense, at least, you want to be able to deal with them even to understand the symmetric point properly. That's a little glib, but it sort of gives the idea. Okay. But it's a good question, right? Often the symmetric one is nice. And if, if you have some application where you just need the symmetric one and you just need the symmetric metric at a point in moduli space, you're good. I mean, it works great. Any other questions? Yeah, actually, I have another question. <laughs> um, do you have any control on? the number of supersymmetry that you're going to preserve at the end with those yeah. LBO that you build? And that's a great question. So how many supersymmetry, do you have control on the amount of supersymmetry you're going to preserve? Yes. So that's actually in the setup of the problem. 
So what I'm doing here is I am constructing the Ricci flat metric on the Clavier manifold, approximately. So let's assume that I have it, right? Then how much symmetry that preserves will just depend on which string theory you're using in it. If I use this in type two string theory, I'll preserve n equals two simple symmetry in four dimensions. If I solve for the gauge fields as well, for example, our illustrious chair did that. If you solve for the gauge fields as well and do a heterotic compactification, you'll solve, you preserve n equals one super symmetry. So in some sense, that's part of the setup. When you're deciding what manifold am I going to solve for in, and you know, back in the back of your head and what theory am I going to use it in, that's telling you how much supersymmetry you're going to have. And then after that, um, uh, you know, the, the numerics is just giving you that thing that's going to preserve that amount of supersymmetry. So that really is hardwired in. Yes, you're going to get a specific amount of supersymmetry. So to give another example, if I wanted n equals two supersymmetry in heterotic, Instead of using P45, I would use P34. That gives me K3. Remaining two dimensions I'd do as a torus. Bob's your ankle. N equals two. I would suggest this is a good line of questioning. In order to not get too far behind schedule, Sorry. let's save the rest of the questions for the coffee break and thank James one more time. Thank you.